place this morning and lift up our hands and honor and exalt and magnify and glorify the name of Jesus. What a joy, what a privilege to come into his presence. Now we were singing that song, call on his name, whisper his name, shout his name. And I was thinking of that story of blonde Bartimaeus. Y'all remember the story? The Bible says that Bartimaeus had heard that Jesus was coming by. He couldn't see. He was blind. But he heard that Jesus was coming by. And the Bible says that he began to, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, I got to think that he probably wondered whether or not, he didn't know whether Christ was going to answer him. And the disciples and those around him, what did they tell him to do? They said, be quiet. But the Bible says he shouted all the louder. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Those who told him to stop went over him and said, Cheer up, he's calling you. Get up on your feet, he's calling you. Jesus hears us when we call him. The devil wants you to think that God's not listening and he's not involved and he doesn't care. But I'm here to tell you when you call on the name of Jesus, he answers you. He's waiting, as the father did with the prodigal son, with arms wide open, just waiting for you to turn to him. So be assured of this. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're crying out to God for, I'm here to tell you, Jesus hears you when you call him. And he answers you when you call him. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. going to go ahead and release our children to go be blessed in Jesus' name. I just want to say uh, publicly, I told him when he was passing the offering that Antoine did a fabulous job with communion. He really paid attention to what he was saying. It was... Um, there was a lot of wisdom in that, and um, it was powerful, and I thought that was so special. And uh, so, you know, we, um, my wife and I and um, Sister Gina Kane and uh, Sister Julie LeBlanc, we've been uh, ministering at the local uh, St. Tammany uh, jail here, and um, it's been a joy. We've, we've had a great time. My wife has been doing it for several years, and uh, I just started doing it um, this past year, and uh, it, it's just been great. But it's been kind of interesting, you know, you come in there and you introduce yourself and, and you know, Pastor David with World Prayer Tabernacle and uh, the guys, you know, they have questions and that's fine, I want them to ask questions. And, uh, but some of the questions are like, I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that question. So one of them asked me, this was when I had first started, to, they, they asked me, you know, the Bible says when Moses was in the, when the Old Testament, he was, he was speaking to, to millions and millions of Israelites and millions of Jews. He would, he, he'd get up on the mountaintop, the Bible says, and he would, he, he would speak, to, uh, speak to them. And he goes, you know, they never had amplifiers and uh, um, speakers and microphones and all that kind of stuff. He goes, how did, how did all those people hear him? I'm like, you got me. <laughs> I said, you stumped me on that one. I said, I, will. I said, but I'll go research it and I'll find out. I said, but I just want you to know, just because... The Bible says something, and you don't understand what it says. It doesn't give us an excuse to say, well, it's not true, uh, right? And he goes, oh, no, no, I, I, I believe it. I, I, I just, you know, so I did. I went back and I researched, and, and, and there was different uh, things that they had given. They said that, you know, when the, if, you, if Moses was up on a mountaintop and the people were down in the valley, it is possible that, that his voice could, could echo um, it's possible that maybe the, the, the message was given to smaller groups of people, and then as that group received the word that Moses had given, then they would in turn take the word and you know pass it pass it down. I don't know, but all I know is God God said that He spoke to to a million or however many Jews as it was that that's what God did. So, but I really had an interest in Thursday night. This one really blew me away. Um, I was kind of kind of leaving, and um, young man came up to me. With another another guy came to me, and he had 
he had his Bible and uh, he opened the Bible and he put the Bible in front of me. While I'm looking, you know, your Bible has two, well, has two columns and at the top of the page on your Bible it has the book that you're looking at. Well, I glanced at the top of the, of the Bible and I looked at that and I didn't recognize that book. So I said, this is going to be simple. All i got to do is tell them that ain't the Bible and it is, I have no clue what you're talking about. But I wasn't let off the hook that easy. It was, it was the Spanish Bible. And uh, so... I don't speak Spanish, <laughs> though I've tried. So it's all right. So he, so at the column, so what it was, it was a Spanish and an English Bible. Thank you, Jesus. So he had the Spanish, that, that was a word I couldn't understand. Well, the other column gave the English. It was Song of Solomon. So I said, okay. You know, and, he's, and he was the only one, I'm not kidding, that was smiling. He's smiling from ear to ear. I'm like, Song of Solomon. I'm like, uh, I'm like, I don't know where this is going to go, but there's not really a whole lot I can tell you. So he, he went to this, and I think this was the, the verse he went to. It says, I, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. <laughs> like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. So I think that was the one that he glanced at, and I said, I said, okay. He goes, listen. He goes, what? He goes, who? Who's writing that? Who, who's saying that? And who are they talking to? I said, well, it's Song of Solomon, so I'm pretty sure that that's Solomon that's writing that. And, and, I, and I said, and you know, the, 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 the Song of Solomon, if the Bible had ratings for like movie ratings, Song of Solomon might be rated R. It's, it's, it's restricted. It, it's like, uh, so, uh, and I told him, I said, I, I said, listen, I said, I think that Solomon, he's writing a, a, a song, a, a, a word. And I said, the book, I believe, is an expression that God has given us of the relationship in a marriage. I, I made sure I told him that, that, you know, you can read that, but, but, but everything that's described in there in its intimate detail is for, is for the marriage, right? So I said, but I'll go do a little, I'll do a little research and we'll, we'll find out what it says. So this is what I came up with. It says, the Song of Solomon is a lyrical poem to extol the virtues of love between a husband and a wife. I got that part right. <laughs> Solomon began, be, be, began his rendering of this relationship with the two lovers in courtship, longing for affection while expressing the love for one another. Eventually, they, came, they come together in marriage, the groom extolling his bride's beauty before they consummate their relationship. Finally, she struggles with the fear of separation while he reassures his bride of his affections for her. All of this reinforces the theme of the goodness of marriage. Some suggest the book also pictures a more general way Christ's love for his bride, which is the church. So, but I just thought that was very interesting. I'm like, couldn't you have picked maybe like the book of Exodus or Leviticus or something like that? I mean, I, I, I'm like, Song of Solomon, like, where's this going? What, what are you going to ask me? I, I don't know what the, you know, and I'm just standing, I'm like, I don't know, you know, I know what he, I know what he was getting at. The, 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 it's very, it's very detailed, but, but anyway, <laughs> what's the chances of that? Can't you give me something easy? <laughs> so praise God. <clears throat> so um, let's get let's get started with the message. Um, so one lesson that I've learned as a Christian: if I wait till I have enough before I do anything for the Lord, I will remain stuck doing nothing. And that, that, that is so true. I mean, that, that is the devil's uh, game plan. That's his uh, mode of operation, if there ever was one, to get us to think that we have to wait for whatever it is we think we have to wait for before God is going to use us. So we say before I, and you fill in the blank, whatever it is, that maybe, it, maybe it's something that God is, is asking you to be used to do something for him, or maybe it's something he wants to do for you in your situation. And before we think God can answer that, we say, well, I need, I need more money. <laughs> I need more time. I need more understanding. I, I need more knowledge. And, and, and then I discovered that that, may, that might be what I need, but that's not what God needs. So as I was, as I was preparing for this message, the, the, uh, my mind kept going to the exchange that Christ had with his disciples with the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And, and I've said this before, when you read the Bible 
Uh, it's very important when you read this to pay attention to the details, to the, to the specifics. Uh, slow down, go back, maybe read it again, and just say, God, just show me what it is, you know, the, the specifics in there. But, but this is uh, some of the uh, quotes from that story of the feeding of the 5,000. And Matthew, Matthew says, but Jesus said to them, they do not need to go far away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here except five loaves and two fish. Now, that wasn't true. They, they, their first response was, we have nothing except five loaves and two fish. You had something. <laughs> they didn't think they had enough. But they said their first response was, we have nothing. Then in Luke, it says, he replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. We have only, they said, was their reply. And then in John, John's gospel, it says, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? In other words, they, they, they figured what they had was not enough. And we know the rest of the story if you read the the, uh, the, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus took what they had, what, what, what they said I had, they, they took what they said they have nothing, and the Bible says that Jesus fed the 5,000. It was more than 5,000. There was women and children, the Bible says. So notice the, the disciples' first reaction was what they did not have. See, God is not asking you to give him something you don't have. God is never going to come to us and ask us for anything that we don't have. But the Bible also teaches us that God can do a lot with a little. So I titled the message today, A Little Oil. A Little Oil. Um, See, so if, if, if we needed everything before God can use us or move on our behalf, why would we need God? If we had everything that we needed, why would we need Him? It's obviously that God made it in such a way that, that the design is we, we need Him, that, 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 that we need to... We need to trust him. So the only thing that God is looking for is a God's looking for a vessel, for an instrument that, that's available to be used for him. He needs, a, he needs a voice, someone that will speak, that will stand in the gap. And uh, y'all know the story of Moses when the Lord called Moses to go and be the, the, to go deliver the nation of Israel out of Egyptian bondage in the in the book of Exodus. Remember what Moses said? In Exodus chapter 4, it says, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God, of the, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. See, Moses thought that all he had was a staff in his hand. He, that, he, he said, I don't, this staff, is, this is meaningless. The Lord said, what is that you have in your hand? Moses said, a staff. The Lord said, throw it down. Moses realized that he had much more than just a staff that was in his hands. So I, I've learned as a as a Christian, to quit waiting for, for what I do not have and start giving the Lord what I do have. That, that's really what God, what, what God is, is asking from every one of us there because every one of us, I believe, have something that we can give to the Lord. And if I, if I sit around and wait for what it is that I think that I need, that in my estimation, before I can do anything for God, I'm, I'm convinced you will never do anything for God because the devil's going to get you to think, get you to think that you need so much that it's going to be something that you will never be able to, to obtain. So each of us have something that we can give. And, and I have discovered the principle that God can do a lot with a little. So I want to go to the Old Testament uh, story about the prophet Elijah and look at, look at one of the stories in the Old Testament. Um, in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, but, but Elijah, in, uh, right before this passage that we're going to read, he had just pronounced that there was going to be a drought, a time of drought and famine in the land, and uh, Elijah uh, pronounced that the, the, the drought was going to last for a few years, he said. 
So God had directed him to go to the Kenneth Ravine, and God had directed ravens to feed him. The, the birds, the Bible says, fed, fed the prophet Elijah. So this is where we're going to pick up the story in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. It says, Sometime later the brook, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the, then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Would you bring me a little water in a, in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord, Spoken by Elijah. So what an extraordinary, what an extraordinary story that, that we have here. That there was a famine in the land. The, the Bible says that a, a famine, a drought in the land. People were desperate for food. They were desperate for water. And the, the Bible says that God told the prophet Elijah to go to, go to a widow. Now, the, 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 Elijah could have been sent to any, any widow, but the Bible says the Lord sent Elijah to a, to, a, to, a poor, to a poor widow. So this story, I believe, is an indication to show us that we have more, we possess more than we realize that we do. So the first thing I believe God wants, to see in this story, wants us to see in this story is you are a vessel directed by God. See, the Bible says that God, God sent Elijah to go to this poor widow, and the Bible also says, I have, I have, directed, I have directed this widow to feed you. But if you read the, uh, the, the exchange that Elijah has with his poor widow, it's obvious that she didn't know that God told her that she was going to be feeding Elijah. She, she, she probably was thinking she was the last person that, that God would use to help anyone in such a time of need, much less her. The fact that she was gathering sticks, and I did a study on this, indicates that she was poor, that, that, that the Bible says there was a famine of, of food and a famine of, with, with water, there was a drought, but it doesn't say that there was a famine for firewood. So the, the fact that she was even just gathering sticks only, only just to make fuel for her fire indicated that she was, she was, she was in poverty, that, that, she was, that she was very poor. But God, but God told Elijah, I have, directed, I have directed this widow to feed you. She was unaware that God was using her and certainly not aware that she could be used. So I, I consider this in, in my life, and maybe you've thought about this in your life as a Christian, but, but how many times do you think that God is using you in situations that you had no idea that God was using you? I believe it's a lot more, it happens a lot more frequently than we believe it does, or than we realize that it does. That that, that just a kind word that you say to someone, just the, just the countenance on your face, the fact that you, that you demonstrate a, a joy and, a, and, a, and an inner peace that, that those around you doesn't demonstrate. Maybe, the, maybe just in a grocery store line or just a, just a word that you said to that, that cashier was something that cashier hadn't heard probably since she's been working there and it was a word that she needed to hear that day. That, 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 that God was using you and directing you to say something or do something that you were totally unaware that God was using you. I, I believe it happens all the time. That, that, that's why we need to demonstrate the love of Christ everywhere we go. We, we need to express the, 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 the love of Christ whoever we come in contact with. We never know what another person is dealing with. 
We never know what, what that struggle was before that person showed up on the job or, 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 or what it was that they're going through in their family or with their husband or with their wife or maybe with their wayward children. And maybe just a simple word of encouragement, just to, just to encourage them, say the Lord loves you. Just, just have a great day. You're, you're doing a great job. You know, I, I appreciate what you're doing for me. Just something special. You may never know that those simple words were something that God had directed you to, you, to be used to speak into the person, that, life, that, that life of that person. I believe that happens more than we, than we realize that it does. But the Bible says that God... God had directed this widow to feed her, to feed feed Elijah. See, when we demonstrate love and compassion, I believe God is using us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, In the Lord's house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. That letter that Paul is writing to Timothy is talking about the church. And Paul said in a Lord's house, there are articles. Guess what the house is that Paul's talking about? He's talking about the church. And he says within the church, that there are, there are, some, there are some vessels that are, that are for dishonor, but there are some vessels that God uses for honor. Those of us, the Bible says, that have set themselves apart to be useful unto God's service. I believe everybody in this church is a vessel of honor. That, 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 I believe that. That, 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 we, that we are here asking God to use us in, 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 any, in any way that he can. But the scripture tells us if we are believers, regardless of my resources, my abilities, my talents, my money, God is using me. See, God, God's not waiting to say, to, to, for, like we say, well, where do I have? Where do I have enough? Or where do I get enough? Or enough time? To, no, God is using us the way we are with what we have. That's what, the Bible, that's what the Bible tells us. All God needs is a willing vessel who make themselves available for his service. So look at this description that I came across talking about us being used as Christians. It says, The sovereign electing grace of God chooses us to repentance, to faith, and afterwards to holiness of living, to Christian service, to zeal, to devotion. See, the the, the believer can think that after we get saved and once we become a Christian, that's all there is. That that God has saved me, he's forgiven me, I've been baptized, I've been born again, all these things that God has done, and now all of a sudden that stops for us. But no, the Bible says that we become instruments. We become vessels for God. We, we become useful to the, to the master's service. Wouldn't you want to be that? To say, God, I could become useful for the master. That God can use me. And he's not waiting for me to get all the things that the enemy is trying to tell you that you think you need before God will use you. God will take the little, take the little that we have. But some of us, I believe, some Christians look at Christianity as a burden or a job. No, it's not a burden and it's not a job. You're serving the master. The Bible says you're useful to the master's service. That's what God has called us to do. I'm happy to be a part of that in any capacity that God uses me. I'm thankful just to say, God, use me in any way. I've always been that that way. But um, I was sharing Friday night, my my wife and I, and uh, uh, Julie was there at the the jail uh, Thursday night, and, um, and there's different things that happen when I go on, on Thursday nights. Uh, I, I felt this past Thursday, God, the Spirit just seemed like he was really moving, that these, the guys were really, uh, really intently listening to the message that I had given them. They, they came, and I think they had about maybe six or eight guys that kind of gathered around the table as I was speaking. And then I got up, and I, I didn't do this every time, but I told them, I said, listen, I'm going to stand up. Y'all can remain seated, and I'm just going to, if you let me do this, I said, I'm just going to lay hands and I'm just going to pray that God will fill you with his Holy Spirit. And they all claimed that they had confessed Christ. They were all uh, born-again Christians and they got all excited about that. I, and and I, I just laid hands on everyone. They were, they were, they were so, so excited about that. Well, as I'm laying hands, praying, the other, uh, other ones in the, in the room that we were in that, that didn't come, some of them began to walk up to me and, 
they were like, you know, they wanted me to pray with them, and that's when the guy walked up to me with the, um, with the Song of Solomon. But, but another, another gentleman came up to me, and we prayed for him uh, uh, Friday night. His name is Derek. And he asked me to ask the church to pray for him, and he said that he, he was battling with thoughts of suicide. And um, I, I looked at him, and I, 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 he, he told me, he said, would you, would you take this phone number down? This is the phone number for my mother, and would you call my mother and tell her that I love her and that I miss her? I said, of course I will. And I, I contacted this mother this, this past week, and she said, she said, well, I love him and I miss him too. And, uh, but what a, see, what a, what a privilege. So I laid hands. I, I said, I said, Doc, I'm going to lay hands. And I said, I'm going to reject and I'm going to rebuke that spirit of suicide off your life because that's not from God. And I laid hands on him and I, I began to just pray, I began to just pray for him. But, but I share that just to tell you, I'm nothing special. I promise you I'm not. And my wife and I talk about this all the time. Before we go, before we go to the jail on Thursday nights, there's all kinds of things swirling in our minds that we can come up with as an excuse not to go. There's a thousand things I can think of. But every single time we go, we're glad we did. And all I'm doing, and, and, and it's, <clears throat> I'm out of my comfort zone with this. I, you're walking into a place, that, these are people you don't know, the, 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 they rotate, it's not the same men that I was ministering to several months ago, it's new men, you, you don't know what, what to expect, what they're gonna, how they're going to act, what you're going to say. And that's totally out of my comfort zone, just to, just to walk in like that. But God says that he can use us. He, we, we all have something the Bible says to give. Every one of us have, have something. And I just count it such a privilege and such a joy to be used by God. So look at the, the widow's reply to Elijah's request for, um, for bread in 1 Kings 17, 12. It says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. She answered just like the disciples said. I don't have any, I don't have any, but only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. The little you have is all God needs. God doesn't need a lot. He only needs a little. See, she told, she told Elijah, I don't have, but she did have. She, she did have something. It, but in her estimation, it wasn't enough. It, 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 it didn't amount to anything. It was like, this, was like th this, this wasn't enough. But she had something. All of us have something. We, we, we can answer God. Even when we're facing difficult situations, our first reaction, our first response is what? To something we face. What's the first thing we say? I don't have. You have something. We, if it's just your life, if you're standing and you're speaking, you, 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 have, a, you have a body. You, you're breathing. You, you have something. But I, I, we always react usually by saying, I don't. I don't. I don't have something. But she did have something. She had a handful of flour and a little oil. See, when we respond, I don't have we're thinking that that's not enough, but God is like, whatever you do have is all I need to accomplish what I want to accomplish in your life. Every one of us have something. So when we take, for example, finances, and we're facing a difficult situation with finances, what's the first thing that we ask God for when we pray when facing a financial situation? What do you ask God for? Be honest. Money. We, we, we ask for money. We, want, we, we need more money. Well, what if God was asking you to trust him with what you already have? Because you have something. Uh, I don't believe any of us can say I'm completely, utterly, totally destitute. I, I, have, I think we have something. There's, there's something that we have, right? All of us have something. So I believe that God is saying, God is asking us, Yes, it's not wrong to ask God for, for more money, and God will bless you, but what if God is saying, why don't you trust me with what you already have? And quit, quit complaining or quit thinking that is so little when God has given you so much. What if that's what it was that God was asking us to do? We have clothes. I think all of us can say, I have, I, I have clothes. I have a, we have a home. We have a place to live. We we have, most of us in this room have automobiles. We have cars. You think, well, I don't have, you have something. See, that's what God is saying. God, God has given every one of us something. 
And the little, God only needs a little. He doesn't need a lot. God will take care of the rest. Just give him the little that you already have. That's all God's asking for. Another example is faith. Our ability to trust God in everything. We, we, I want to have faith. I want to trust God. Some of you say, well, if only I had the faith of, of Billy Graham or, or the faith of Pastor Carl or the faith of fill in the blank, whoever it is. And God says, no, I'm not asking you to have their faith. I've given you faith. How about exercising the faith I've given you? Because all of us have that, the Bible says. In Matthew chapter 17, it says, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. The Bible says all you need is faith as small as a mustard seed. Like, the, like almost like a grain of sand, something so small, the Bible says. And we think we have to have this big, gigantic, God says just faith as small as a mustard seed. And God, God can do the rest. Another example is knowledge and wisdom. We, and it's not wrong to ask for knowledge and wisdom. The Bible says in the book of James, if any of you lacks wisdom, what do you, what do, you do? You just ask for it. So guess what I do? I ask for it. I need wisdom. You, you, the word says if you ask for wisdom, you'll get wisdom. But we ask for that. When a lot of times we're looking for knowledge and for looking for wisdom, especially for those of us who want to who share our faith, who want to evangelize, we want to we go witness, we want to go share the love of Christ with, with others, but we think that, that what I have or what I'm, the knowledge that I have or the understanding that I have is not enough. What you have is more than enough. If all you share with someone was your personal testimony, that would be, that would be like, like over the top, more than, more than God would ever ask any of us to say. Because that is something that God has done for us. So all of us have something. We have something to contribute, something to give. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows, who, who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. The Bible says if you're a believer, you have the mind of Christ. That's a lot of knowledge. <laughs> That's a lot of wisdom. That, that, that's a lot of understanding that God has already, that God has already given us. So, again, I've discovered in my walk as a Christian that spend less time on what I do not have and more time on what I do have. Quit, quit looking at the things that you wish or think God needs to give you and start concentrating on the things that God already has given you, the things that you already have, the resources you do have, the abilities you do have, the gifts and the talents God has already given you. Begin to exercise those things. If God has given you a mouth, you have a voice. You have, you have the word of God just to, just to speak the word of God to someone's life. That's the, you say, well, that's a little. That's all God needs. That's all God's looking for. Then look what God did with the little the widow had. In 1 Kings 17, 13, and 14, it says, Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have, from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. God will multiply the little that you have. God, God is, the, is, the, is the supernatural multiplier. I want you all to know that. Elijah told the widow, don't be afraid. Some of you need to hear that today. There's situations that you're facing in your life, and, and maybe that's what God is, is, is trying to communicate to you today. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God has given you all you need. But Elijah told the, the, the poor widow first, she, she explained to Elijah, this is all I have, and after my son and I eat this, we're going to die. And Elijah said, after, after she said that, he said, first give me from what you have and make some for me, and then, then, then God, will, God will provide. It says that the Flour never ran dry and the oil, the oil jar never went empty, the Bible says. 
See, this is a, a biblical principle that I know that works. When you give, you get. We think of that a lot of times only with tithing, and it is true for tithing, but it's, the, it's a principle for anything that we do in our service and our lives to God. You, you devote anything that you have to the service for God, and I promise you, God will multiply and give that back to you ten times over. I've seen it happen in my life time and time again. Joey Salino and I used to talk when we were in Chalmette. Um, his kids were young, mine were young, yours were at the time were probably a little younger than mine was, but we, we were serving with Pastor Carl and his 12. He, he had a team of 12. It was 12 men and 12, 12 women. And we'd meet with Pastor Carl one night for leadership. We'd have another night that we'd meet for a uh, for small group. And there was a lot of things that we were involved in and committed to. And Joe and I used to always say that, that yes, this is a, like a lot, of, a lot of time that we're spending. We're investing a lot of time. But somehow, some way, God always made time available for everything else in our life. How it happened, I don't know. But I can tell you God does that. It's the principle of giving. It's the principle of giving to God what you have, and God multiplies what we give Him. So I believe the Lord is telling us to quit telling Him what you do not have and give Him the little that you do have. Because all of us have something that we can give to Him. God can do amazing things with a little oil. So I may ask Ray just to come and just to start, to start playing. And uh, the end of this uh, passage in 1 Kings 17, it says, She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. So praise God. You can stand to your feet, please. I want to give an opportunity for salvation here this morning. I believe God's moving in the room. There might be some here, someone here today. You've never, you've never confessed Christ. You've Brother Antoine came and shared the, the communion, the, the, the meaning of the cross, the, the Lord's Supper, the remembrance of what Christ has done for us. That death that Christ died was for you. It was for every one of us, the Bible says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe you've never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. Maybe you've never just simply said this prayer, which is this, Jesus, I need you. I want to surrender my life to your control. I want, to, I want you to come in. I want you just to forgive me, just to give me a new life, just to, just to give me, just to give me new, new, new life. And you want to pray that prayer today. And you say, would you pray with me? I'll be happy to pray with you before you leave. So I'm asking us, everyone, just to bow your heads and close your eyes, nobody looking around. That's you here today, and you've never prayed that prayer. But you feel the Holy Spirit moving, and you say, would you... Would you pray with me today? I need you to pray. I need encouragement. Just slip your hand up for just a second. Let me see who you are, and I'll be more than happy to pray with you. I see that hand there. You can put it down. Is there anybody else? Never confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but you, you want to make that decision today. Praise God. Right? Would you come forward here? I'm, I'm thinking you've done this before. You haven't. Okay, well, praise God. This is awesome. I'm excited for you. I'm sorry. No, we love that. 